Happy Jurassic June, everyone! Recently, dinosaurs have had a resurgence in popularity, and as a dinosaur enthusiast, I couldn't be any happier. Dinosaurs are such amazing creatures, and it's awesome to see them brought to life on screen. For the most part. It's cool seeing how dinosaurs are brought to life, and how they have evolved on screen. So, to kickstart Jurassic June 2023, I thought I'd talk about dinosaurs' important place in cinema, and how they helped revolutionize it. Now, before we look back, I must clarify a few things. First, I won't be talking about every dinosaur movie in existence because other people have done videos going over the history of dinosaur movies, and I haven't seen every dinosaur movie in existence. Which, is that even possible? Also, I will only be talking about specific dinosaur films that revolutionized movies and how we view dinosaurs on screen. Lastly, I will also be counting kaiju movies here. With that being said, let's do this. It all starts back on February 18th, 1914, with the animated interactive short film Gertie the Dinosaur, directed, produced, and written by Windsor McKay. Prior, Windsor McKay made animated shorts like Little Nemo and How a Mosquito Operates, but Gertie played a crucial role in the world of animation, as it pioneered techniques such as keyframes, registration marks, tracing paper, the mutoscope action viewer, and animation loops. This paved the way for a whole generation of animators such as the Fletcher Brothers, Otto Messmer, Paul Terry, Walter Lance, and of course, Walt Disney. I will be talking about one of his films later. As you'll see going forward, different kinds of animation played a key part in bringing dinosaurs to life. Fast forward February 2nd, 1925, and we have The Lost World. Based on the 1912 book of the same name by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who made a cameo at the beginning of the film, this silent film follows an expedition crew that journey into a plateau on South America where dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures are thriving. The film was directed by Harry O'Hoot and featured stop-motion special effects by Willis O'Brien. Prior, Willis O'Brien had worked on stop-motion shorts such as The Ghost of Slumber Mountain and Along the Moonbeam Trail. The Lost World was his feature film debut with his effects, and here was much more refined with a better frame rate and better looking models. This film also popularized the idea that prehistoric life could still be alive hidden somewhere on the Earth and the Lost World trope to film. On April 7th, 1993, King Kong was released. King Kong is a film that hardly needs any introduction, as it was the first full-blown blockbuster that showed audiences many things they have never seen before. Directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Shodasak, this film follows a plot similar to The Lost World, except it's on an uncharted island in the Indian Ocean. Like its predecessor, the film has stop-motion effects done by Will O'Brien. Another game-changer for King Kong was sound. While well, not the first film was sound, that honor goes to 1927's The Jazz Singer, King Kong was revolutionary as it had sound that was not only high quality, but also took full advantage with the use of creature sounds and Max Steiner's soundtrack elevating the scenes. King Kong inspired and paved the way for countless future filmmakers and artists. One of them was a young lad named Ray Harryhausen, who I will talk about later. Disney is a studio that needs no introduction. Released on November 13th, 1940, Fantasia is an animated musical anthology film that features seven segments such as The Sorcerer's Apprentice, A Night in Bald Mountain, and the topic of this video, The Rite of Spring, a segment showing a visual history of the primitive Earth from the Big Bang, the planet's formation, the evolution of sea creatures, and the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. Fantasia is a big first for dinosaurs as it was not only the first time dinosaurs appeared in a full-length, traditionally animated feature film, but also the first time dinosaurs appeared in color. Now that I've talked about the dinosaur aspect of Fantasia, it's time to talk about the techniques that were used to bring them to life. Which is fitting because it ties into how Disney revolutionized animation in general. Walt Disney and his team redefined animation with multiplane camera effects, impressive theatrical surround sound, and lifelike character and creature movements. The latter of which was challenging for the Rite of Spring, as there were no living references to bring the dinosaurs to life, and the animation team had to find a way to make their movements seem natural. But against all odds, Disney pulled it off. Now it's time to talk about another influential animator. 
This guy deserves a chapter dedicated to just him, because he's a legend, and when he animates dinosaurs, it's awesome. After seeing King Kong, the first of many times during its initial release, Ray Harryhausen started experimenting with animated sharks. Following his service in the United States Army, Harryhausen made his big break with the film Mighty Joe Young on July 27, 1949, where he worked with the previously mentioned Willis O'Brien as an assistant animator. On June 13, 1953, Ray Harryhausen made his debut as a full animator for The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Directed by Eugene Laurie, this movie is based on the short story The Foghorn by Ray Bradbury that was released around the same year and is about a prehistoric beast dubbed Retosaurus, breaking free from its icy prison after researchers detonate a nuclear device. This monster then unleashes havoc across the East Coast. This film is what kickstarted the kaiju genre. While the idea of a giant monster rampaging in the city is nothing new, with its predecessors The Lost World and King Kong, the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms got the idea of introducing a made-up monster rampaging in the city rather than an extinct animal or oversized living animal. The film introduced many tropes and archetypes still used in the kaiju genre. It also introduced Ray Harryhausen's signature stop-motion animation style, Dynamation. Dynamation is a technique that involves using a split-screen process with the rear projection filling the background image, then the subject matter atop the animation shot behind it. Finally, a sheet of glass would be placed between the stand and the camera strategically blocking out images during the scene being filmed. The result would be an amazing viewing experience. Ray Harryhausen would animate stop motion for many more projects, including The Animal World, One Million Years BC, and The Valley of Guanji. Each film was entertaining, and the effects gave dinosaurs a whole new life. Now we are going over to the east. Godzilla, or Gojira as it's known in its home country, was released across Japan on November 3rd, 1954 nine years after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The film was directed by Aishiro Honda, who had taken inspiration from the previously mentioned King Kong and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, so much so that the monster was originally going to be brought to life through stop motion, but due to budget constraints, the film had to go for suitmation. Suitmation, as you may have guessed, is when the monster is brought to life by having the actor or actors don a suit of the monster. For this case, it was Haro Nakajima. And let me tell you, being in the suit was one of the most, if not the most difficult part of the movie. For starters, vision was limited and it was difficult to move, and it was so hot that Nakajima actually passed out. Well, King Kong and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms helped pioneer the kaiju genre, Godzilla redefined it with a darker edge, linking the monster to nuclear terror and having the film feel more grounded and serious. The film was also not afraid to show people dying in some pretty grim ways. This is further helped by the bleak atmosphere and Akira Fukupe's soundtrack, elevating the sense of dread. This leads to the next highlight, Godzilla's Roar. Prior, movie monster sounds were created by using stock animal sounds with modifications. This was something that was going to be originally done for Godzilla. Sound technicians tried modifying the sounds of lions, tigers, and night herrings, but none of the results were unnatural enough. It was then that Akira Fukube got the idea of using an instrument instead. He recorded his assistant rubbing the strings of a bass with a leather glove covered in tine par. The result is now iconic. Godzilla would inspire and influence various filmmakers as well as a new wave of monster movies all across the globe. Godzilla would also spawn a franchise, with as of this video being uploaded, 36 films, 3 TV series, has teamed up and fought with all kinds of monsters, and even received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Our journey now takes us to the 80s, a decade of flashy clothes, wild hair, rockin' music, and awesome movies. While the 80s released a good deal of animated movies, a lot of these films struggled financially. It wasn't until the mid-80s that animation had a new renaissance that lasted through the 90s. One figure that played a huge part in this movement was Don Bluth, as he not only helped kickstart the animation renaissance, but also gave us some of the best films from this era. 
After the success of 1986's An American Tale, in which he collaborated with the legendary Steven Spielberg, expect him in the next chapter, the two collaborated again for what is part of this video's topic, The Land Before Time. Released on no November 18th, 1988, the Land Before Time follows a group of young dinosaurs' journeys to the Great Valley while dealing with a T-Rex dubbed Sharptooth. Luth and Spielberg wanted to do a film similar to Bambi, but with dinosaurs. Another big influence for this movie was the previously talked about Red of Spring segment in Fantasia, so much so that the film was originally going to have no dialogue. This idea was abandoned, however, in favor of using voice actors to make it more appealing to kids. To bring the dinosaurs to life, extensive research was done with visits to natural history museums, skeleton reconstructions, fossils, and paleoart from the turn of the century were referenced to help create credible landscape and animals. Live-action footage of quadrupedal modern animals were also studied. The film also introduced the concept of anthropomorphic dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were now the characters taking center stage, and the audience was meant to feel for them. It also portrayed the dinosaurs in how you say, cute. The Land Before Time was a box office hit, and spawned 13 direct-to-video sequels. Skipping five years later, to June 11th, 1993, to the release of... Jurassic Park. Directed by Steven Spielberg, this film was based on the 1990 book of the same name by Michael Crichton, following a select group of people chosen to tour an island theme park populated by dinosaurs recreated from prehistoric DNA. But as you have guessed, things go wrong. Now it's a fight for survival. The general public was still used to dinosaurs being slow-moving dumb monsters that drag their tails around, and with studies of dinosaurs being the opposite of this, it was time for a portrayal with the times. Originally, Phil Tibbet was going to bring the dinosaurs to life via stop motion, like it had been done for the past 68 years. This seemed like a logical choice, as Tibbet had proven himself with acclaimed titles, most notably animated segments for the television documentary Dinosaur, that went out of the way to have the dinosaurs portrayed as living animals instead of monsters. But when CGI previews were presented to Steven Spielberg, he decided that CGI was going to be the way to do it. And it was for the best, because as much as I like stop motion, a lot of scenes were going to be hard to bring to life if they had gone that route. Phil Tibbet would stay on board with Jurassic Park as a supervisor with a good idea of animal movements. Stan Winston's animatronics and puppets would also be used to balance things out. Now CGI in films was nothing new at the time. Movies such as The Abyss and Terminator 2 Judgment Day have incorporated CGI, but Jurassic Park took it to a whole new level. Now dinosaurs could be allowed to be portrayed as fast-moving, intelligent animals on screen. Another game-changer for Jurassic Park was that it pioneered view paint. This allowed artists to apply texture and color directly on the computer models, whereas before, it was indirectly. And the rest is history. Now, movies could bring things to life that seemed impossible, all thanks to Jurassic Park. So that's the history of how dinosaurs helped revolutionize and push the boundaries of cinema. What do you think? Is there a movie I missed out? Or anything you would add? Let me know! Now before I sign off, I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out and thank you to the channel Old and New. I used their remixes of the soundtrack from 3D Dinosaur Adventure for this video, and I plan to use more of their soundtrack in later videos. Let's make Jurassic Dune 2023 a great one. See you soon!